To help sort this out and for a sense of what may, go, may be going on inside the White House, I'm for, joined by former Chief of Staff and former Governor John H. Sununu. Thank you for being with us, Governor. Good to be with you. So first off, we are in unique territory right now for any U.S. administration. How do things stand right now? What does this mean for the White House that a special counsel has been appointed? Well, it, it certainly makes life a little bit more complicated for them, but I actually think it's a net plus. Yeah. I really do think that it, it will now uh, allow the investigation to go on without talking heads running to TV every 20 seconds. And frankly, uh, Bob Mueller's uh, reputation uh, will enhance what comes out of this. And if, if the White House is correct that there's nothing there, uh, he will give it the imprimatur they need for that to stick. The, the president's calling this the greatest witch hunt of a politician in history. That's obviously debatable. But how much of this do you think is partisan politics and how much of this is the president bringing some of these problems on himself? Well, I think you have to go back to the overall situation. Uh, this Anyone who goes into a White House, even if they've been involved in politics, is always surprised at how different uh, and demanding the, the communication with the public and through the media is. Uh, this administration had very few people that had ever been elected or been involved in, in serious politics. So it was doubly so for them. Uh, I've often given the example that nobody realizes the magnification effect of the White House until they're there. And the example I always give is that when I was there, George Herbert Walker Bush said he didn't like broccoli and it became a front page story for three days and we had an agricultural crisis that we had to tamp down. That magnification effect is real. Everything Everything they do, everything they don't do, becomes a front page story. And I don't think they were ready to handle it. And they're getting a little bit better, but they're not quite at a point where they're going to be able to manage it easily. Point Blake, do you think it is obstruction of justice for a sitting president to ask the FBI director to ease up on investigations that may involve a member or a former member of the administration? But the fact is, is he didn't do that. Hmm. He, his, the, the quote that is given is, I hope this will eventually go away. That's an expression of an aspiration, not a, an indication of a of pressure or demand. And I really think that this is uh, that aspect of this has been blown up. Uh, but certainly, uh, under the magnification effect of the White House, uh, has tremendous legs through the media. Right. And, and to that end, are you concerned at all uh, at the manner in which some of this is unfolding, with, with a lot of this playing out in the press? But we're seeing sort of official Washington or bureaucratic Washington rear its head in an interesting way here uh, in sort of generating a lot of these headlines for the press. Look, this, this is a, a political city. Washington is a political city. Politics is, is very much part of the game. And, and those that are anti-Trump are taking full advantage of this, including those in the bowels of the bureaucracy. And, and it is something I don't think the Trump, President Trump or the Trump administration, uh, in terms of, of folks like Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon and, and, uh, and, and Mr. Kushner, and, and I don't think any of them understood how difficult it would be to deal with that and and one can only hope that over time they will learn how to do it in your opinion is President Trump in danger of impeachment I don't think so I really don't I, I there's nothing nobody has pointed to anything which is which is a, 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 an improper act they may have been stupid acts they may have been blunders they may have been utilization of bad language in the process that may have been insensitive to the to the pressures and demand of the office but there has been really nothing pointed to that has any criminality to it at all and without criminality there will be no impeachment you mentioned the president's words mattering. The idea that the president can send uh, representatives out there and they can offer an explanation for something and, that, and then in another interview the president gives a completely opposite explanation. That creates more problems to the White House as well. I'm curious, did you ever have to worry about message discipline like that with, with President Bush? Uh, fortunately, we did not. Um, I, I pointed to the broccoli situation, which was a surprise, right. but that's probably the worst problem we had in terms of semantics. We had a pretty dis 
disciplined White House internally. We had a lot of folks with experience. Uh, I had, as governor, witnessed, witnessed and been uh, involved in, in tough assaults from the media. So, so there was good experience in the White House. Um, Brent Scowcroft had been through a couple of White Houses. The president himself had been vice president for eight years. So, so it was not as difficult a transition as the Trump White House is facing. And I know you've told a story in the past about, in, on one occasion, President Bush's reticence uh, created a lot of headlines in, in terms of when the Berlin Wall was falling. But that reticence actually uh, was to the advantage for U.S. security and also the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah, George Bush was very sensitive to, to the effect of the words of a president. And when the Berlin Wall fell and, and we brought the press, the gaggle of the press in for the uh, uh, op, press op in, in the Oval Office, they were rather vicious and aggressive about why the president wasn't, in essence, standing on the desk and cheering and wasn't going to go to the Berlin Wall and cheer. But George Bush understood the problems that Mikhail Gorbachev was having with his hardliners and knew that if he rubbed uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's uh, nose into it, uh, it would be a problem. And so he, he bit his tongue. Uh, took it in a very calm way, and, and Gorbachev in his memoir uh, really relates the fact that that was a very important moment and that Bush managed it quite right. You said before that uh, you actually met Vladimir Putin back in the early 90s when he was just uh, an advisor to, I think, the mayor of St. Petersburg at the time. Was there a sense, even then, obviously, you couldn't know that his career trajectory was going to be so far upward, but what were your, was your sense of them back in those days? Well, it was a fleeting meeting. I mean, it was only a few moments. He was chief of staff to uh, Mayor Subcheck of, of Leningrad, St. Petersburg, uh, at the time. And, uh, but but he, he, he looked like he was um, a significant figure at the time. I actually thought Subcheck was by far uh, the most impressive figure mm -hmm. that I met in the Soviet Union when we did that that one week long trip um, uh, requested by Gorbachev to come teach the Soviets, the Russians at that time, how to do things. But Subcheck died an untimely death, and I think his death is one of these minor facts of history that could have had a serious impact if it had not occurred. And speaking of those twists and turns of history, what do you think Vladimir Putin wants? out of all of this, that we know that he's deeply aggrieved by the fall of the Soviet Union. Do you think we're going to see him try something in the Baltics similar to what he's done in Ukraine? I think Vladimir Putin wants to restore the old Soviet Union to its splendor. Uh, it is it is Russia now. It, it was degraded, if you will, by the loss of the republics, uh, and so he wants to compensate for that by by, if you will, reestablishing the economic strength and the military strength of the Soviet Union. I don't think he'll do anything dramatically dumb. Uh, I think, uh, frankly, in, a, in a, one of the most important things President Trump has done was the launching of those missiles into Syria, uh, showing that that the United States is not hesitant to project power and I think that was an important sobering message uh, to Vladimir Putin so he'll continue to press he'll continue to, to stretch things he'll continue to test us but I, I think he's smart enough not to cross the line and you think the president President Trump is in a position where he can confront Putin without feeling encumbered by any of the politics that are swirling around this domestically. Actually, I think he feels empowered by it uh, because uh, uh, the tougher he is with Putin, the more credit he will get as a result of, of the perspective that the liberal media has tried to create here, that, that there is a, a, a uh, what I think is a ridiculous statement that the president and Putin are in codes. Let's go back to the domestic side of things. What should the Trump administration do to try and get things back on track right now? Well, they did something that was very important. They, they worked with the House to get the, the uh, Obamacare, uh, Obamacare reform uh, package through. Uh, they've got to work with the Senate to clean it up. They ought to be, in my opinion, pushing hard on the infrastructure package. I think that will get bipartisan support. I think they, they, they ought to take advantage of a, a desire that appears to be there with a little bit of bipartisan support for tax reform. So they should take advantage of some easy wins early uh, and then take retake on the tough one, which is the Obamacare repeal and reform uh, at, at an appropriate time, probably uh, towards the end of the summer into into the fall. And the president is such a singular figure. Do you worry at all about what this means for Republicans beneath him? The, the health of the party sort of in Congress and the Senate and what we head into in 2018? 
Look, the party is in extremely good shape across the country. 31, 32 governors, uh, a governor here in New Hampshire for the first, a Republican governor here in New Hampshire for a long time, state legislatures under the control of the Republicans. And frankly, uh, I think the public understands uh, that there is a difference. So so the the base of the party is in good shape. Uh, the, the turmoil in Washington is certainly a little bit of a problem. And as always, you have senators and congressmen uh, and congressmen Congresswomen that are uh, having a little bit of cold feet in the process, but I think the basic strength of the party, which is back in the states, will carry it through. Does it trouble you at all that the public perception of what's going on in Washington, there's such a tremendous gulf, right? On one side and the left, uh, there's uh, views that essentially Russia is a puppeteer of the president. On the right, it's, it's a big conspiracy theory and nothing to see here. Is that a problem long term for the United States that people have such differing views of what current events are? I think there is a strong issue in the United States in general that that we have lost uh, the depth, if you will, of civics understanding that used to be taught in depth in schools. Uh, I think folks really don't understand how hard the process of governing is. Uh, they don't understand that checks and balances are good. It's been given a new name of gridlock now and it's bad, but it, it frankly is the strength of the system that it's sometimes hard to make major changes so that, that when you do make a change, it's been thought out and debated and compromised to a, a point where it is good for the country. So I think there's a fundamental problem from which all those issues that you raised flow. Hmm. One last question here, this is kind of a fun one. If sometime in the mid-1980s, the ghost of New Hampshire politics yet to come uh, arrived at your doorstep and said, you know, a number of years from now, Sununu will be governor, but one of his major uh, policy issues will be full-day kindergarten. Uh, what would you say to that? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, looking with, with a little bit of, of foresight in the process, that, that this is a different world where we, we have a workforce of a lot of women who want to go out and earn a living, and that this governor uh, understood that the conservative perspective would be uh, to facilitate getting people off of social programs, you've got to give them something like, uh, like uh, kindergarten. And so I think it's a very conservative move. Governor John H. Sununu, always on message, no matter if it's uh, <laughs> government or family or both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining Thanks us for today. Thanks for letting me be here. We appreciate it.